Welcome Home, where we provide information, inspiration, and motivator after motivator after motivator here on America's Next. I have Yeshua Claus here with me today. How you doing, Yeshua? Thank you, sir. Thank you for having me, Cedric. I appreciate it. I'm very good. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, you seem to be very much anchored in who you are and what you're providing to the world. I look forward to talking about that today. Man, let's go. Let's have a good yeah. discussion about that. I'm hyped. Absolutely. Where you want to start? Well, you know, with me, it always starts with the art um, because that was the gift I realized that I had at a young age, and I'm so grateful for that. So we can start there, but we could also start where, wherever we need to start, really. Right. You know. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, what was your life like as, as a young child? Where were you? And where were you raised? Great question. Um, you know, I had one of those upbringings. I was a lot in Chicago. Hold on, start over. Did you say you were a young a young kid raised in Chicago? Yes, sir. Okay, go ahead. Yes, sir. Yeah, we could we could repeat that several times. That's key. You know, that's right, right. For me, you know where you're raised is really part of the mm -hmm. initiative for my upbringing even with all the um the bumps and bruises and the joy that was involved with it okay and, um you know i'm that's where i'm from so looking back you know now as a grown man um i look at it as a very culturally rich environment I look at it as a blessing that I had a, a single parent mom who worked her butt off in order to um, introduce me to to maybe thinking about myself as an artist. Um, and I'm grateful for that. Absolutely. What were some of what were some of the influences that stuck out to you growing up in Chicago? Yeah, so you got influences all around. And the way that I think about influences, Cedric, and I'm sure that, you know, many of the people watching could even relate to this, is that you don't get to choose your influences, especially when you're young. So if there's something in your life that you're looking for, that you want to achieve, or even that you just want to be around, as a youngster, you still have the power to attract that in your life. So for wow. me... My influence was my friends. I didn't have a father that I was raised with um, in the house. And I was always looking for a male role model. I didn't know it at the time, but that's what I was looking for in the friendships that I made. So I was hanging out with the older guys and I was trying to figure out how I was gonna become a man based on them as my role models. Those were my major influences was my friends and they became family. Right. Wow. Were, th were there also musical influences? Yeah. You said musical, Cedric? Yes. Oh, man. You know, it's funny because uh, me and my mother was just talking about that the other day. Um, it's interesting because I was raised in South Side of Chicago, predominantly black neighborhood, raised by a single parent white woman. My father's black. My mother's white. And she was like the most soulful white woman that I think I even met to this day. You know, she would she would play all the Motown music. I grew up listening to Stevie Wonder, mm -hmm. Lionel Richie, real soulful songs that, you know, talked about triumph. They talked about the human condition. Mm -hmm. They talked about being being resilient and just being and, and using love as an energy. Um, so that's that's kind of what I grew up on. Of course, you know, once I once once the CD player was in my hands, you know, it was all hip hop from then on out. Right. Right. Now, growing up in Chicago, I'm sure you dealt with a lot of wind. They call it the Windy City. You dealt, <laughs> yes. you dealt with a lot of elements and, and all of that probably served as character building elements for you. Would you say that? Man, I love how you put that. Um, man, the wind is harsh. Anybody that, that's from Chicago out there or has been to Chicago, 
you know, I would suggest if you're going to visit, go in the summertime because the wind that's your enemy in the winter, that same wind <laughs> is your friend in the summer. Trust right. me. That's right. when you go. Yeah. But no, the wind, the wind was harsh. You know, that was part of the terrain. Yeah. We didn't, we didn't um, know of anything different, but, you know, everybody wear masks now because of the pandemic. Hey, in Chicago, we wear a mask every winter. That's wow. just how deep it is. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. OK. Now, was your was your relationships with your other family tight? Like, did you have good relationships with your aunts, uncles, cousins? You know, what were your what were your holidays like? Yeah. So. My mother was. To be frank, I put it I put it frank so we can get right to it. She was abandoned by her family. So that means that she raised me on her own. And I do believe it takes a village to raise a child, mm -hmm. but that village doesn't have to be your blood family. Mm -hmm. And what my mom did was her best friends, her girlfriends, those became my aunts. Those became the family. So it's disingenuous for me to say that my mom did it all alone. Of course, she pieced it together and she she made it work for what she could do. But holidays, Cedric, they were small occasions. She had one sister who, um, you know, would come over with, with her daughter, my cousin. And it would just be the four of us often on a Thanksgiving. So holidays were not really a special big thing for me. Um, because it wasn't what I saw on TV. I wanted to see the, you know, the big family, everybody sitting around a table and, you know, sharing food and arguing over this and that. But it was pretty low key. And it's interesting as we talk about family, and I have a lot to share about that. But my father's side of the family didn't come into the picture until just this past year. So wow. growing up, I had very small family. Wow. Were, were you were you looking for your father or were you not even thinking about him because your mother was so strong and so busy doing all of the work? You know, I think as a young guy, you always looking for a role model, a male role model. And that's what I mean when I say, Cedric, I was looking up to the older guys for that leadership. Right. So I didn't know it at the time that I was looking for my father. I just knew that I needed some leadership on what it meant to be a man. Right. And of course, even though a mom could do everything that a father could do, she could go out, work, pay the bills, provide. One thing she can't do is teach a boy how to be a man all the way. And right. my mom did the best she could, I suppose, but I was still trying to fill in those ingredients. So, yeah, um, you know, that that has been a big part of my journey. And that part of my journey has become part of my artwork. You know, that's sure. that's part of the, the questions that I work through today. Right. Now, when you look when you look back on on the people who uh, you built relationships with them when you were young, do you look back and say, wow, some of these guys were a positive influence, but some of these guys who I was looking to for leadership, they also didn't have their fathers in their life. That's what you realize when you get older. In fact, if I'm being real, even when I was younger, I could tell the guys that had fathers and I could tell the guys that didn't have fathers mm -hmm. just from the way they moved. Mm -hmm. I could tell just in the way that they walked, the way they carried themselves. Mm -hmm. If a guy felt like he has too much to prove, mm -hmm. I wonder, oh, maybe that's an insecurity. Mm -hmm. And that was, a, and I say that without judgment because that's an insecurity that I had as well. Mm -hmm. So I could see it in others. Um, you know, I think also what I noticed was that I tended to hang around the guys that didn't have fathers also. Right. It's interesting how that happens. I have a right. choice. Right. I could have chose to hang around the guys that had fathers and maybe had a little more security, mm -hmm. but I chose the other route. And, you know, that's interesting. And I still yes. think about that today. Yes. You know, I think about that. Yeah. yeah. Let's 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 get into that a little bit, because I can I can identify what you're saying when you're interacting with somebody. There is a, a, a certain 
wholeness when somebody has their father. It's, it's like um, you can sense it. You can sense the, the stability. It's like, no, I'm solid. I don't I don't have to. I don't have to go that way with you. I don't have to. I, I can go home, you know. Right. Right. Uh, I'm perfectly fine going home, you know. But when you when you're dealing with somebody who doesn't have their father, you can sense the incompleteness. You know what I'm saying? Like you almost can see it in people's eyes like you broken somewhere, you know, and I like that about you because I'm broken somewhere, too. And, and, and my question to you is, does lack of fathers in our communities give way to a, a, a rebel type of attitude? You know, I think that it definitely can, um, because one thing that I learned growing up and I found out pretty early was that my mother couldn't hold me accountable in the same way that I felt a man could. Mm -hmm. And, you know, she did her best to discipline me mm -hmm. and to, to keep me uh, safe. But I broke the rules because I wasn't afraid of my mom too much. Right. But but I do think that if I had a father in place, I would have respected boundaries more. Right. I'm just telling you the simple truths of how I grew up. I'm not, yes. you know, it, and and this is this is a, of no fault of of anyone. This is just the situation, you know. Yeah. But but but, you know, I, I do I do see it as a, a crack in the concrete of our communities that needs to be addressed. We need to seal that crack up. The mm. crack of the crack of not having fathers in our children's lives to install like you said the accountability. Guess what? I can listen, I can listen to anybody. But it's something about when somebody provides the gravity and the seriousness of law that's going to get my attention. And so we need we need balance. You know, you you can say, "Hey, can you come here please?" Can you come here, please? Can you come here, please? And there's a difference between that with young man, get over here. Yes. Two different types of gravity. And we have a long, long standing desire for balance when it comes to gravity. Um, because like, like you said earlier, young people attract, right? Meaning that young people are like magnets. And, and what goes along with magnetism is gravity. You know what I'm saying? Mm. And so we got to begin to look at the similarities of the things we say and the physical universe. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm with you right here on this, man. That's very interesting. That's very interesting. Mm -hmm. The law of attraction is a very real thing. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And we do tend to attract what we are and what we think about, what we what we constantly obsess over. That's what we attract. Mm -hmm. And you bring up some very valuable points. I agree with you. In the black and brown communities, lack of uh, proper fathers in the household is part of the distraction, right? right? So if we can, you know, I think I think if if I could look at my younger self, and if I could say to my younger self, you know, give him some advice, I would say. Hang around them dudes that got dads. Mm -hmm. Hang around them guys. Look at the way that they move. Look at the look at the security, the sense of self that they have. Look at it as a positive thing. Right? Look yep. at that as something that and be don't be afraid to learn from your peers. Right. That's right. Word. I think that's powerful, man. We need to we need to connect with people who have more whole families because like they say, birds of a feather flock together, but also you become who you surround yourself by hundred you know? percent. So while we can't, while we can't change the reality that everybody doesn't have a father or a mother in their home. Yeah. What we, what we can do is build relationships with other people in our communities who might have that. Now that I think that's a good starting place. That's a great starting place. And I want to add on to that and say it's unfortunate we got to do the work 
to bring in that supplementary family when it's missing. But guess what? Nobody's going to do it for you. Right. So right. you were given the cards that you were dealt, and now it's up to you to make the best play with the cards. You right. might have to reshuffle the deck. But if you can find positive role models in your life, go ahead and cling to them. Mm -hmm. Without a doubt. Yeah. Now, when did you when did you start to express yourself through art? Man, I've been doing art since I was in that high chair eating baby food. You know, wow. my, let my mom tell it. She, you know, she put a crayon in my hand and would tape some paper to the mm -hmm. tray and I would just go to work, you know. Right. But I really knew I had something special when it came for the art project time in school and the other kids was leaning over my shoulder as I'm drawing and they like, ooh, mm -hmm. draw me next, do, do one for me, can you do my project? So I knew that I had an ability that other people wanted and that they was willing to trade for. So I knew right. I had some power because of this ability. Wow. Did, did you ever did you ever identify other members of your family who might have also been artists or is this something that you kind of just saw from yourself? No, I believe that things um, are transferred in the genetics, of course. My dad was a craftsman. He was a like a carpenter, you know, a worker. You know, he was he was throwing up drywall and painting and and he, he did some creative things. He did some uh, like paintings and drawings. I found that out more recently, actually. But he was a hands on guy. He was good with his hands as a craftsman. So. I think I may have got it from him. I definitely didn't get it from my mom because she is not okay. an artist. Right. Yeah. So what was what was what was school like for you? We're talking um, middle school and high school. What was your experience like during those times? Well, you know, it's a wide range of experiences because it's a lot of fun. You run around on a playground at recess playing Nerf football. You know, you are, uh, you know, messing with the girls in the jump rope. Um, you know what I mean? You're doing all those fun things. Um, and school wasn't something that it, it wasn't something that I that I hated. I actually I, I liked school because I like to be around people who were thinking and I didn't really like the school work, but I did it anyway. My mother was a public school teacher in Chicago for 30 years. So education was important. And for me, it wasn't so much about the assignments, I was interested in learning. I was just interested in, you know, what was the next chapter in the book that I could beat everybody to? Mm -hmm. How could I, if I could know where the story was going before the next person, then I felt like, yo, I'm good here. You right. know what I mean? So I was kind of always like curious in school. I was always that, you know, I was that student that was trying to read a little bit further, or trying to show off a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm I'm grateful again to have a mom that also impressed that upon me that you know books were always in the house you know she was always reading like mystery novels and things like that right so so grade school was dope high school became challenging because once you hit high school it gets confusing you you got you really start getting into girls um you know I'm from Chicago so there's also the gang element um. You know, as well as every high school got clicks. You got the kids who think they're the cool kids. You got the jocks. You got the, you know, the people who stay in the after school program. So you're trying to figure out your identity at a very right period of time. And so there was a lot going on in high school for me. And, I, and also at that age of teenager, you're trying to figure out what's the boundaries you can push past. You're trying to figure out what's the rules you can break. That's just right. natural for a teenager. Mm -hmm. Yeah, without a doubt. Now, did you have any any um, civil, cultural, or domestic um, events that impacted you during those years? For instance, when I was in middle school, I think I was in the eighth grade when nine eleven happened, and it stopped. It stopped everything. I mean, it would you had forty kids in the classroom looking at a TV monitor, you know, and I never forgot that. Did you did you have any experiences that were happening either in Chicago or across the nation that really kind of stained your psyche that you still carry with you today? You know, 
Cedric, during that time that I was growing up, you're talking about the early 90s, mid 90s in high school, the plague that was going across America was the crack era epidemic. Mm. And because crack had hit the black and brown community so hard in the 80s, by the time I was in high school in the 90s, a lot of my friends were selling crack or dealing with that element. So along with that came the gang culture and the resurgence of it when I was in high school. So it's not that it was one incident like 9-11, but it was kind of like the climate at that time. It, we, we were very aware of the dangers of being a, a young black man in America. You were dealing with stop and frisk by the police daily. You was dealing with the challenges of negotiating gang territories. And, you know, you might have friends that unfortunately fell victim to the streets in one way or another. So yeah. this was kind of the, the, the climate at the time. It wasn't necessarily um, one event, like a life changing event. It was sort of like small, multiple events. Right. You came out of an era where we were we were dealing with the, the consequences and the ramifications of crack, you know, and you it seems like you're one of those people who were like crack is whack, you know, one of those people who are like, I'm going to I'm going to avoid it at all costs because look at what it's done to my community. Um, I, there, there's, there's more than likely was crack needles on the sidewalk and little kids going back and forth to school, you know, abandoned houses, abandoned buildings, full of people either using this drug or the paraphernalia of this drug. And so, you know, how did, so how did you feel about crack? Was it something that you avoided? Was it something that, you know, upset you? Did it, did it, did it cause a conflict between you and the world? How did crack impact your life? To me, it was most disappointing to see adults behaving like children because when people were buying crack or on crack, they were subservient to the person who was selling the crack. And the person selling the crack was usually much younger than them. So the role was reversed. Mm -hmm. The adults were coming to the kids for what they wow. needed. You wow. see? Yeah. So I think that was a major a, a major impact that had on me that, wow, where's the leadership? If the adults are the ones that's coming to the kids for their fix, the kids are the ones that's in control. Mm -hmm. And that to me was a major turnoff from participating in any of that at all. I have friends that was involved with it, but... Um, you know, we stayed away from that. Like, again, fortunately, I did have a mother who I knew loved me and tried her best to take care of me. So I knew that at the end of the day, I didn't have to go too far out of my element. You know, I always felt like I was kind of dancing on the edge mm -hmm. of, of street life. Mm -hmm. But I knew at the end of the day, that wasn't me. You know, right. I had something bigger. I knew I was going to be something bigger. And I'm not going to say that I knew I was going to be an artist at that time because I didn't have artist role models, but I knew I was going to be bigger. And then I, and I was like, if I just could preserve myself long enough, I'll figure it out. You know what? I would like for you to take 15 to 20 seconds and speak to the young people and young adults in America today. We have 440,000 youth in a foster care system. A lot of them are in the foster care system because their parents were impacted by drugs. One of those drugs being crack cocaine. But you also have young people clear across America, they're in high school, wherever. They might be good at art, but drugs are still plaguing their communities. Can you speak to them today? Yeah, those are my people. That's right. Um, You know, I think that they're listening to this because we need to hear one another's stories. We need to hear one another's encouragement. And 
the thing about it is that it's a lot of them out there listening, Cedric, that got the same feeling I had at their age, which is I'm bigger than this. And I just got to say, it's a fact. You're bigger than it and you're going to figure it out. It takes time sometimes to figure out what's your thing that's going to get you to open up your potential. But as long as you can preserve yourself, as long as you can maintain, you can figure it out. Make sure that you honor your journey enough so that you can figure it out, so that you can take your time, protect yourself, self-care, self-maintenance, protect yourself. Give yourself time to figure out your journey. It's coming. I love that. I love that because that's exactly what it takes. You have to honor your journey. You have to know, hey, I'm going somewhere. Five to 10 years from now, I want to be in a new place. So no, I'm not looking to run out of this house or run out of this school building and go fight somebody to the death. I'm not, I'm not looking to run out of this schoolhouse or run out of my home and go steal a car and land myself in jail. I'm not looking to end my life. Right. Because it doesn't end here. Right. right. And, and I, I, I felt it myself. You felt it yourself. That's why you spoke on it. And I see us dealing with it today. The, the idea that I'm going to live today like it's my last. I'm going to live today as if I'm not going to survive tomorrow. Well, I just wanted to jump in. Go ahead. Because I'm inspired by what you said. It's a lot of anger inside of us. That's right. It's a lot of anger, feeling like my family disappointed me. My father wasn't there for me. It's a lot of anger about the government's handling of us as a people. It's a lot of anger about the history of America. It's a lot of anger. It's all kind of, it's anger against the police. It's anger against the teacher. It's anger against this person. It's all kinds of anger that we have. And I can't emphasize this enough. Do not direct the anger inwards. Your anger has to be converted into Ooh. something constructive. Yeah. And you got to figure out what that is for you. For some people, it's taking a boxing class. It's getting in that gym. For some people, joining the track team. For some people, joining the chess team. It, I don't know what it is for every single person, but it's it should be as unique as you are. It might be something weird that's not even in the book. It's not even a category yet. Right. You got to figure it out. That's what I mean by figure out your journey and honor your journey because your journey might be something weird that's not in the book. It right. don't matter. If it saves your life, it's for you. I love that, man. Energy cannot be created nor destroyed, only transferred. And we have to be the types of people that take bad energy and convert it into good energy. Because you're going to be upset. You're going to be upset. But what, what Yahshua is telling us today is that you have to be a converter of energy. That's the key, y'all. We're going to be right back after this brief message with more wisdom, experience, and art from Yashua Clark. America's Next Motivator, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, at 5 p.m. Eastern, Tuesday and Thursday at 10 a.m. Eastern. America's Next Motivator, hosted by me, Cedric Riley, and sponsored by the Pride Empowerment Network.
And we're back with Joshua Claus. How you feeling, sir? I'm feeling great, bro. Thank you so much for having me. This is a great discussion. You know, mm -hmm. I can't wait to, for us to really get into it even more. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, with that being said, I pulled up a video that describes for people a little bit of what you're doing and the magnitude of what you're doing. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, sit tight. Oh, yes. This is getting ready to be super dope. Dope means cool, it means authentic, and it means high level. It means elite. I want you to tag somebody, text somebody, tell them to get into the building for the remainder of this conversation because we're looking at a generational leader here, y'all. Give us a second. There's no way to hide being black in America. One has to, at some point, contend with and deal with social injustice and violence towards one's own body. So my first woodblock piece began a series of work I called the Banners series. I carved portraits of friends of mine from head to toe I was really interested in scale and perspective. While the figure is larger than the viewer at eight feet tall, the vantage point the viewer is looking at the figure is still from above the figure. So I'm interested in this tension here. And maybe that tension is about subjectivity. In the Eastern tradition, the main character is the landscape and life happens inside of it. When I made diagrams how to hide in the wind, I was considering what element is important to my environment. Being raised on the south side of Chicago, we often talked about how the wind was a threat, the wind was dangerous. It was brutal, actually. And yet there was really no hiding from it. There was no way to escape that. I relate that idea of the wind as this ubiquitous threat to what I see daily as the threats upon black bodies in America. The landscape and the figure are contending for visibility. We often live in an urban landscape that is threatening to render us invisible. So growing up, I think I was always aware that part of our identity construction was drawing from resources in the environment. So a lot of times in the work, you'll see figures that are made from these scraps. That's the language that I'm thinking of when I'm carving a wood block and printing that wood grain. How can I charge this figure with this identity that's made from the materials around it? I moved from making that banner series, then started using the woodblock prints as source material for collage. Now I'm using large blocks of wood again, but I'm printing them and using those as source material for a collage that's on a scale that I've never worked. I'm creating a large mural tapestry. It'll be about 40 feet long and 15 feet high. It references the Diego Rivera Detroit industry mural, but I'm taking out the workers that he painted in, which were mostly white male workers, and I'm putting in the faces of my family members. Like many African-American families, mine moved up from the South to the North for jobs in industry. The auto industry was for black folks, our access into the American dream. I'm interested in how that American dream has also disappointed us. It's also my personal attempt to bridge the gap of estrangement between my family and I. Because I didn't grow up with this family, we're all quickly trying to get to know one another. And that takes a lot of labor. That takes a lot of love. So all of these ideas are embedded in the mural and embedded in the carving that I'm doing in all of the labor that I'm pouring into the wood blocks that I'm printing from. I'm certainly charged by an entirely new level of commitment and new inspiration. The inspiration this time is personal as well as political, of course. 
because while this is my family story, this is also the story of America. And I'm just trying to put faces to that story. Can you talk about that piece a little bit? Yeah, that, that brings us full circle, actually. Thanks for showing that, Cedric, because at the beginning of our conversation, I mentioned growing up with single parent mom raising me, not having much family at all until very recently. I did a DNA test because I wanted to find the African countries that I was connected to. And what I, I got my test back, but a year later, I get a Facebook message. Somebody says, hey, this is your, they said, no, they sent me a photo of me when I was seven years old. I never seen before. And when I met my dad two times in my life, one time when I met him when I was seven, he took me to Michigan and he and I met um, the other side of my family, his brothers and sisters. That's when that photo was taken. So when I saw the photo on Facebook, I was blown away. I walked back and forth. I paced back and forth. I didn't know what to do. It was overwhelming. And the person on the other side of the message said, I think we're cousins. We did a DNA test over here. This is my phone number. You can reach out to us if you like. We'd love to hear from you. Needless to say, Cedric, that turned into this huge welcoming in of the family. This is my father's side of the family. I didn't grow up with them at all. I met them one time when I was seven years old. And now overnight, I have this amazing, loving family. Very generous people. So that video, it discusses the mural that I'm making, which is all about family. So I went from making work, which was about the self identity, the way that we build ourselves from the environment around us. That's how we construct ourselves, right? We, we, we build ourselves from what's, what's available. We talked about influence. That's right. That's right. So these are all the influences that we build ourselves with. However, now the work is discussing where does the self fit in the larger picture? Now that I'm resolved in who I am, now that I'm grown and I've figured out my journey and my path, how do I now fit into a larger relationship with a family? So this is what I'm discovering now. Absolutely. And I think it's so profound how you take work and you bend it into a more uh, of a deep context. The work that you now have to do to establish a strong relationship with this whole new family that you found. That's a lot of work. The, the, new, the new aunties in your life that are now gonna be working, 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 on the scaffolding of life to make sure you understand that they're your auntie. The new uncles, the new cousins who are gonna be standing on the scaffolding of life, sculpting away at you as much as they, as they can to, to make sure that you know, I'm your uncle and I'm your cousin. And so now, you know, life is working on you. And so that's the type of work that I think we need to start talking more about exploring more of and realizing that that's a man's work. Mm. A man's work is putting together his family. A man's work is working on the members of his family. That's the work of a man. That's the work of a woman. You say, well, what, what is a real woman? What is a real man? A real man and a real woman are people who work mm. on their families. I love the way that you I love the way that you took that picture because see when I, I don't know if 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 I'm thinking of the right picture, but I think of this picture where these these guys they they look like they were um immigrants and they're sitting on this beam across the skyline. Yeah. And you can tell they had a hard day's work, and it's like you know, back in the day, you would be sitting on a beam. And it looks like it's sitting in midair, you know, stories. Yeah. And you took those men off of that beam and you put your family members there. 100%. Wow. Wow. 
hundred percent, Cedric. That was put so beautifully. Um, thank you for you know for seeing that work and for seeing my journey with that kind of clarity. I agree with you that a real woman and a real man's work is about their contribution to family. Whatever family means for you, it doesn't mean that it has to be your biological family. It doesn't mean that it has to be a family that's immediate. It could be community, right? right. But it, could it be is foster care and adoption. Foster care and adoption. Yes. It, it's all it, it's it's all the same concept that we should be family builders. Right. We should be family builders because when you're and I'm gonna let you take the mic back. I just wanted to say this. We should be family builders because when we are family builders, then you instill a sense of value in people. And that sense of value allows people to manifest their destiny the way that, that, that Yahshua did. My goals now are to become a better person so I can give more to other people. Mm -hmm. So when I was younger, it's about independence is what we're searching for. And th this is just the stages of growth, right? You can research this, but there are levels of, uh, of growth in humans where the last stage is interdependence. Interdependence means that you connect with another person, a partnership or a community, a family, and you both become better from the relationship. Right. You can't both grow better from that relationship unless you're independent first, unless you're solid and on, you know, on your own, you can hold, you can stand up on your own first. So once you get to that point, the goal is to be able to give, to give, the goal is to give. That's what it's all about. And yes, work on yourself, especially if you're young, people think the word selfish is a bad word. I don't think so. I think that when you're young, it's good to be selfish, meaning you should be focused on improving yourself. And then you get to a stage where you can share that beauty and all your abundance and all of your talents and, and all of your thoughts with somebody else. That's, that's what we're trying to do. And I know I'm talking as if I wrote this in a book or something, Bro, this is a new lesson for me. I found this family and through the family, they're teaching me how to be a part of the family. They're teaching me how to be generous from me seeing how much they give, right. me seeing how much they're willing to contribute and sacrifice for each other. Mm -hmm. It's so beautiful. I didn't grow up with that. So I'm learning this new. Right. So this, this is a new beginning for you at this stage in your life. You still have a new beginning. Yeah. You know, I want to I, I want to congratulate you on, you know, having the humility to 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 engage in a new beginning. Mm. You know? um, and, and just. I just want to just commend that, man, because I, I, I can I can identify with that as well. You know, I, I saw my father and my father's side of the family just a few years ago as well. And so when I'm listening to you. I see myself in your story and I wonder how many other young women and young men are, are experiencing the same thing, you know? And so I'm just happy for you, man. I'm Thank you, happy. bro. Yeah. Yeah. Now what's next for you? Where, where do you see yourself going next with your art? Yeah. So I'm preparing for my first solo museum show, which is 2022. It's at the Welland Museum. That's upstate New York in Clinton, New York. So that mural that you just showed in the video, that's the anchor piece to the whole show. That's like the main attraction of the show. The show is called Our Labor because it's about, yes, the black families moving from the South to the North to get jobs in the auto industry. And that's the labor of building the American dream that black folks have done that we have been uh, written out of the, the books, but we have built the, the foundation of America, right? Mm -hmm. So it's about that, but it's also about the labor that it takes to hold a family together. That's our labor. Our labor is in the task of 
building relationships with other people. That takes work. That takes sacrifice. You know, mm -hmm. that takes generosity. That takes, you said the word best, humility. You have to be humble in order to establish a relationship with somebody, especially someone you don't know. Right. Yeah. Now, what do you say to people who who, who ask facetiously, what's the pay? What, what, what pay do I get for that work? The work that you're talking about of building my family, working on my family, working on myself, being interdependent. You say that that's work, right? Yeah. Where's my pay for that? What do I get in return for that? Speak Great. to me. Great question. Because this gets at the biggest secret and the trick that's been put on us. Let's go. So we live in capitalism. Capitalism suggests to us, no, it demands to us that you are valuable based on how you relate to a larger economy. You are valuable and you get to reap the benefits of it monetarily, meaning you get rich if you are selfish, if you are self-centered. If it's a dog-eat-dog -dog world and you're the biggest dog, you get the biggest paycheck and that'll make you happy. We know it doesn't work that way. We see the examples of unhappy rich people around us all the time. In fact, many people who start getting money, since we said the word pay, they start getting money, the sadness grows deeper, the pain grows deeper. Wow. Because now you, now you can fuel it. Money is fuel, that's it. Money is fuel. No matter what your, what your fire is, you're throwing money into the fire. If your fire is a passion to be a better person, to be generous, you throw money in it, you're more generous. If your passion is to, is to be dominant, supreme, bigger than others, you throw money in it, you get inflated. Mm. But, it, but the inflation, we know what happens with inflation. Things inflation lose value. At some point. Yeah, it fails. It lose value, you know? Exactly. And I, I just, I just want to add to that because you're on to a great point here that we need to do a deeper evaluation of what value is. Mm. And, mm. So for, and, and so for the people who say all of this emotional talk all of this emotional talk uh, doesn't translate to the fact that bills are coming at my door every day. So I don't have time for this. I like to put it in this perspective. When we don't have a clear idea of what value is, see, value is on a scale. Value starts with humanity and it ends up with fruits of humanity. If we are only concerned with the fruit of humanity, then we are always going to be corruptible as a people. And so mm. we end up spending all of our money on the corrupt fruits of humanity, being violence, racism, uh, bigotry, people being locked out of uh, financial positions. All these different things are the symptoms of us not having the real core value in place, which is humanity. When I, when I value you as a man or a woman or a child, the payoff that I get is that you, you, you take a positive path in this world and you come back to add value into my life. You come back with an image of me that I could have never created because you were artists. You come back with a story about me that I could have never created because you were a storyteller. And so the value of this work is that later on down the line, you contribute vastly to society. That's the payoff that we need to be looking for. The payoff that instead of this person dying earlier, going to jail, he's going to make a profound contribution to the world. That's the pay that you get when you value one another properly. Now, yeah. yeah. And you got to value yourself, right? Yeah. In order, yeah. In order to do that. So. So, yeah, and to go back to your question, what's the pay? The pay is that you grow as a person. 
The pay is that as a result of your your contribution, your sacrifice to building family and to growing real relationships, you get solid as a person. Mm -hmm. When you solid, you can't be shaken by a lot of things that you're shaken by currently. You get stronger, you get more fortified. That's what we want. We need to be able to survive. We need to be able to build fortunes. We need to be able to build wealth. And you can't do that if you have a weak foundation. So right. it comes back to that. And we all know that your family is your wealth. And I can't say it enough. Family is who you choose family is. My brother is my best friend from day one in high school. That's my brother. I have recently discovered I have two more brothers through this family. But my day one brother, that's my brother. Mm -hmm. They my brothers too, but I'm getting to know them as my mm -hmm. brother. This guy, he's proven he's my brother, you see? And that's, that's my wealth. That right there is how I know I'm a wealthy man because he'll never let me starve. If I if I needed anything from him, he'd give me the shirt off his back. Mm -hmm. So if I don't have a shirt, he got a shirt. So I got a shirt. Right. right. That's the pay. <laughs> right. I think I think that's that's a that's a great way to round third base in the show. You know, we need to be reminded that when we value one another, we prevent people from feeling worthless. Mm. And we have a huge amount of value being left on the table day in and day out. We got mm. young people feeling like nobody's paying attention to them. We got adults who feel like nobody's paying attention to them. I, I had a conversation just last week with a full grown adult who feels like, Nobody values them, mm. an adult. Mm. And so be reminded that we have an opportunity to let people know that they're valuable. We have an opportunity to be reminded of ourselves that we are valuable. We are valuable. You are valuable. We got thousands of young people in the foster care system that need those affirmations, the gravity and the balance of a family. Like Yahshua said, family doesn't doesn't always mean blood related. Family is a decision mm. to uphold the value of one another. When I when I did when I decide to uphold the value I see in you, that makes us family. That's right. That makes us family. And That's right. Out of, yeah. And, and nine it. times out of ten, when somebody can feel that you value them. They don't say, oh, no, oh, no, I don't value you back because we don't look the same. I don't value you back because we're not from the same place. No, I value you because you value me. So there is a huge return waiting for us when we begin to value one another. Now, I just got a couple more questions for you, sir. And Let's uh, go. Let's go. Yes. I love this, man. And I yes. want to be real because, you know, when we first talked about doing this, Cedric, what I said, I said, man, I said an hour is a long time, bro. I'm busy. I don't know if I could do a whole hour. But Cedric said, listen, he said, the people need an hour. They need an hour of this food. Oh, yeah. That's right. And the way that you said that, I thought about it. I was like, you damn right. Let's give them a good hour. Right. That's a fact. fact. That's a fact. What is What is survival to you? Survival to me. Survival to me is knowing, knowing how to be flexible. Mm -hmm. If mm. there's nothing we've learned from this pandemic, it's that you can't plan too much. So you got to be able to have a plan, but to be flexible and move a little bit. Even as career choices, I've had to pivot and do different things, things that are opening me up. And I'm wondering why I didn't think of this before. You know, Cedric, all of these Zooms and, and this Facebook, for example, that we're doing, we, you, I mean, I don't know, you know, how, how far back you go with this platform, but this is very new to a lot of people. That's right. But yep. damn, look at all the people we can touch through this. We need to keep doing this. So I'm happy to be flexible and to learn new things in order to survive. Without a doubt. We got about 15 seconds left. What is success to you? Success to me is knowing yourself, 
knowing your inspirations, knowing your motivations. That's success. That way you surround yourself with those, everything else disappear. What is greatness to you? Greatness gotta be in finding your highest self, pushing past your limitations, no excuses. There's reasons you can give yourself a why you should stop, but as long as you can break through and get to the, the higher self, which is more requires more responsibility, more effort, more sacrifice, that's greatness. Absolutely. Yashua Kloss, I want to let you know that I've listened to your story today. I've appreciated you telling it, sharing your, your adversities, how you overcame challenges. You gave a lot of value to our people today. I think that there are certain uh, decisions that we make that make us iconic in our generations. You being the type of artist that you are, it makes you iconic. I want to give you a crown today while you're still living. Ladies and gentlemen, put your crown emojis in the building. I want to give you your respect while you can still receive it. I want to let you know, Yashua Kloss, that you are America's next motivator. Let's go, man. Thank you so much, Cedric. Absolutely. Absolutely. Respect. Thanks for everybody for stopping by. And thank you, Yashua, for stopping by today. All right. All right, brother. Thank you so much, man. I'm so happy that you're doing this. I respect and appreciate you for lending your platform. Um, thank you so much, man. I can't Absolutely. wait to... To, to chop it up with you even more at some point. For sure. Talk to you later, bro. All right, bro. Peace. Peace. Ladies and gentlemen, there you have it. Each and every episode of America's Next Motivator is going to have something here for you. All you've got to do is stop by and pick it up.